Hey, welcome to the first episode of a brand new series on my channel, which I like to call Marx and Chill, where we read Marx and we chill. We will begin by reading the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, and today's video will only cover the first part of the first manuscript, which relates to wages. And if you're ready to learn, I will encourage you to go ahead and skip to the time I put on the screen right now. But I do want to take the time to quickly explain to my current subscribers, and of course, those of you that want to stick around for this series, I want to explain to you what you can expect from me and my channel moving forward. So what exactly is Marx and Chill? So Marx and Chill is a long-term project that I would like to take on on my channel. Basically what happened is that it had been my goal towards the end of college to read all of Marx's books and I just basically never really got going with my goal. Mostly because I then graduated from college and I had to figure out how to pay the rent and once I figured out how to pay my rent, I basically had to figure out how to not to die emotionally from having to pay my rent. So I feel like now I've regained a sense of self and I want to take on this goal. In fact, all of last year I've been having this crazy idea that I should just read Marx on my channel and basically I didn't because I figured everybody would unsubscribe but at this point I really don't care because not only are we stuck in our apartment still for God knows how long, but also at the current rate at which the vaccines are going out, it might take 10 years before the entire population is vaccinated. And if I'm gonna die alone in my apartment, I'd much rather do it having red marks like I always wanted to. <laughs> and if I take this on as part of my channel, I feel like it's gonna give me some kind of sense of responsibility to actually get it done. And also I figured there might be some of you that are actually interested in the same goal and to sit down and read this writing by yourself is really difficult and mostly why I gave up because especially once you get the capital, the language gets extremely abstract and sometimes it even takes hours just to get through a single page. So basically I figured let's be nerds together and read some marks already. Now of course I'm still gonna make one video a week and depending on the response I get from you guys, I may or may not prioritize this series, meaning these videos are for you and if I see that you're not enjoying them then you know, I'm not gonna want to keep making them, but if I see that more people are getting a lot of value out of it than just me, then of course I'm gonna prioritize making them, so please let me know in the comments of the videos if you're getting something out of this series. But of course, if you like the current videos I'm making that are more introspective or political commentary, I'm still gonna make those because just knowing myself, I can already tell that there's gonna be some weeks I'm gonna wanna break from this heavy reading and you on the other end might need a break as well. So if you don't like these videos, just feel free to skip them. My channel is not really gonna change other than the fact that every once in a while you're gonna see a Marx and Chill video come up in your timeline. And like I said, if you just are not into it, just skip it. For the purposes of this series, I will be reading from a PDF that is available online. All the original works by Marx are now free of copyright. However, be careful because what does have copyrights is when publishers put together a bunch of his works into one book. So I will be putting the links to the free PDFs on the descriptions of my videos. If you of course would like to buy a book because some people do prefer to read like the physical copy of a book, please consider supporting a local bookstore or just somebody else other than Amazon. There's also things like an app called Libby which allows you to borrow books from your local library. And lastly, I do want to clarify that I'm not going to be reading the original text on video because then that would just make this an audiobook. So instead what I'm going to do is basically summarize slash interpret the text and if you're somebody that is serious about this goal or you're maybe using this for study for your own education i'll go ahead and encourage you to please read the text before you watch my videos i don't know why when you read a text before you actually discuss it like you get more out of it so even if you don't understand anything that the text said just try to read it all the way through and then play this video and then we can talk about it Okay, so here we go. The Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. Now, I'm not gonna lie, the preface is a little bit tough to get through, so just bear with me. So first of all, Marx explains that he already commented in another journal that he's gonna critique Hegel's philosophy of law, which, by the way, if you're a student of philosophy, please let us know in the comments what the hell is philosophy of law. But as he was publishing this critique, he was realizing that it was very, like, convoluted and that he should also publish a critique of law, ethics, politics, 
in a series of independent pamphlets and then later try to show how they connect and present a critique of the relationship but only to the extent that capitalism itself touched on these subjects. Now, I would like to stop right here and just explain this concept of political economy. Marx is going to say political economy a lot. Basically, political economy is capitalism. A political economy is an economy that is based on power relations and power disparity. So if you think about communism, everybody's supposed to be the same in communism. This, of course, is not the case in capitalism. Some people have more power than others. Some people have all the power, some people have none. So anytime that you read political economy, just feel free to replace that phrase with capitalism if that helps you kind of understand what's going on. Then he quickly explains the basis of his research and he says that he's gonna base his critique on the work of French, English, and German socialist works and that a huge influence on his work was this philosopher Feuerbach who criticized Christianity and hierarchy and basically explained that religions are projections of human desires and that that's why human beings go towards religion. And basically this philosopher turned away from looking at religion and went towards a more practical way of thinking when it came to philosophy. So basically what I gathered was that Marx is going to take this position and he's not going to allow religion to cloud his judgment. So basically, when I looked at the footnotes, the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 is the first work in which Marx tried to systematically elaborate problems of capitalism from the standpoint of his dialectical materialism and communist views, but also to synthesize the results of his critical review of the current philosophic and economic theories. So what the hell does that mean? Basically, there's this thing in philosophy called the Hegelian dialect. He basically looks at humanity and says, humanity moves forward through conflict. So there's one idea, a conflicting idea, and basically there's conflict in humanity and we arrive at the response, basically at the synthesis. And then eventually that will be the prevailing idea, but then we will move forward and have a conflicting idea and there will be conflict and we will arrive at the result. And so this is just one idea in philosophy. Another idea in philosophy has to do with idealism. People that think that the mind creates everything. You've heard that famous like phrase, I think therefore I am. So those people think the mind creates everything that exists. And that idea also aligns with religion, God creating humans in his own vision, right? So his vision, his mind existed before the world. However, there came an opposing view, which is called materialism, which says the mind is a reflection of reality, so I am, therefore I think. And Karl Marx is basically gonna embrace this idea that all there is is material things and all that we should be concerned with is like our activity as humans. And please philosophy people, help us out in the comments if I get any of this wrong, help us understand. And so in this manuscript, what Marx is going to do differently than anyone else is he's going to combine those two different ideas together. He's going to say humans do move through history through conflict, but, or and, <laughs> all that exists is material things and we should be concerned with kind of human activity. And if that doesn't make sense at all, do not worry. We're going to keep going. <laughs> So, the first manuscript is called Wages of Labor. Wages are determined through a hostile relationship between capitalist and worker. First of all, can we appreciate that he just really gets to the point in the first sentence of this? And he goes on to explain this antagonistic relationship. He says, The worker is dependent on the capitalist, but the capitalist has ways of increasing his income while the worker has no way of supplementing his own income. The separation of labor, capital, and rent is only fatal to the worker. Wage rate is as low as possible as long as the worker can survive. Workers earn money only when they work, while the capitalists of course can earn money through interest and things like people paying them rent while they're not working. The worker has become a commodity and must submit to the demands of the capitalist. For example, if the need or demand for workers fall, a group of workers will have to beg and starve. If the supply for product exceeds the demand, this will affect profits, rent, or wages. 
still affecting the worker. Meaning, if the workers produce way too much stuff, then the capitalist doesn't get enough profits, so he either has to figure out how to hike up the price of rent or how to lower the wages so that he can make profit still. So essentially, the worker does not gain when the capitalist gains, but does experience losses when the capitalist experiences losses. And finally, the price of labor and stuff has an inverse relationship. There is less profit when wages are higher, and when the wages are lower, the profit for the capitalists are higher. Labor prices vary while profits are always stable. Individual labor varies and isn't rewarded the same. For example, two plumbers might charge different rates. However, prices for items remain equal. So now, let's take a look at three conditions that can happen in society and how workers fare during these three conditions. In cases where the worker and the capitalist suffer equally, the workers suffer just by existing. The worker has to struggle not only to survive, but to get to work and to perform the work. Now what happens in a society where the wealth is declining? The working class cannot gain as much as property owners during a prosperous state, so in a downturn you can only assume that they're going to suffer even more. And lastly, what happens in a society where wealth is increasing? This is actually the only favorable condition to the worker, however, the higher wages can lead to being overworked because now the worker wants to make more money, he has the opportunity to make more money, but they must sacrifice their time and carry out slave labor and lose their freedom in the pursuit of money. This stress can lead to shortening of the lifespan of workers, which ironically is necessary, so there's always a fresh supply of labor available. And in the case that the profits are growing, they're only a result of the accumulation of labor, accumulating capital through someone else's labor, which again only serves to make the worker feel as if their labor, their existence, and their activity belong to the capitalist. Now, in this society where their wealth is still increasing, the accumulation of capital increases the division of labor, and the division of labor increases the number of workers, and vice versa. The increase in workers increase the division of labor, just as the division of labor increases the accumulation of capital. So if you guys think of like the place where you work, the more things there are to do, you hire more people, but every person now has a smaller scope of responsibility, right? Division of labor and the accumulation of capital, two separate things, means that the worker depends on labor exclusively and that the labor becomes very machine-like. And as the worker becomes more depressed spiritually and physically, he's also becoming more and more dependent on the fluctuations in market price, how capital is applied, and just the general whims of the rich. And as the class of people who depend on work increases, competition among them intensifies and lowers the price of their labor. Lastly, in a society which is prospering, only the riches can survive off interest slash investments. The other capitalists have to carry on with what they have or carry out new ventures and basically risk the money that they have, which creates intense competition among the capitalists. Big capitalists eventually ruin the smaller capitalists, some of which fall to the working class, which causes a depression of wages for workers because there's now more workers, and the dependence on the big capitalist increases. This separates the capitalists from the workers even more. The workers do not present any threat to the capitalist. However, the competition among workers becomes more and more intense, and a portion of the working class will fall into homelessness and starvation, just like a portion of the middle class fell into the working class. Even in the condition of societies most favorable to the worker, the inevitable result is the worker being overworked, premature death, debt, the threat of falling into starvation or begging, at least for a portion of the workers. The rising of wages excites in the worker the capitalist mania to get rich, but they can only do so by sacrificing their mind and body. This raising of wages also entails the accumulation of capital, which sets the product of labor against the worker as something even more alien to them. So basically, the worker has no connection to the wealth they are producing. Similarly, the division of labor makes him dependent on other workers and brings him into competition even with the machinery. And lastly, this amassing of wealth increases the amount of industry, creating a surplus of production, which inevitably ends with layoffs or by reducing the workers' wages to the smallest possible amount. Can't help but think about the US while reading all of this, right? But I'm getting ahead of myself. 
However, eventually the state must reach its peak. What happens to the worker then? And he quotes Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations. In a country which has acquired that full complement of riches, both the wages of labor and the profits of stock would probably be very low. The competition for employment would necessarily be so great as to reduce the wages of labor to what was barely sufficient to keep up with the number of laborers and the country already being fully peopled, that number could never be augmented. So Marx concludes that the surplus of people would basically have to die. In a declining state, the worker will experience increasing misery. In an advancing state, misery with complications. In a fully developed state of society, the worker will experience static misery. Now, according to Smith, a society of which its majority suffers is not happy. And even the wealthiest state of society leads to the suffering of the majority. And an economic system and society based on private interests leads to its wealthier condition. Thus, the goal of such an economic state is the unhappiness of society by default. Now, the capitalist is compensated for rising wages by the reduction of labor time as well as interest on capital and commodities. But let's take a look at capitalist theoretical and practical claims about the workers in a capitalist state. The capitalist says that the product of the labor belongs to the worker. But in actuality, the product only belongs to them as long as it is necessary for them to have it in order to exist. And of course, for the continuation of slave class of workers. Most of us work so much, but we only have that which is necessary for our existence unless we're rich. The capitalist tells us that everything is bought with labor and capital is nothing but accumulated labor. But at the same time, tells the workers that they must sell themselves and their humanity. Now, while the rent of the landowner is a third of the profit of the soil and the profit of the capitalist is twice the price of interest in money, the worker at best of times earns so little that two of his four children must starve and die. And now I have no idea if this was some kind of like common knowledge back then or just like him being dramatic. <laughs> According to capitalists, it is only through labor that one can enhance the value of the products of nature and labor is man's active possession. Yet, it is the idle landowner and capitalist who is superior to the worker and the one that lays down the law. Capitalists say labor is the sole unchanging price of things, but actually nothing is more exposed to the fluctuations than labor itself. Now, while the division of labor raises the productive power of labor, increases the wealth and refinement of society, it actually impoverishes the worker and reduces him to a machine. It makes the worker dependent on the capitalist, it intensifies competition among workers, and it causes overproduction in the inevitable slump that follows in society. According to the capitalist, the interest of the worker never opposes the interests of society. However, society always and necessarily stands opposed to the interests of the worker. The reasons why capitalists say that the interest of the worker never opposes that of society is because rising wages are compensated by reduction in labor time and you only account for losses in relations to individuals, not society. However, Marx believes that labor in itself is dangerous, not just the fact that the goal of labor is to increase wealth, but the labor itself is dangerous based on the capitalist reasoning alone. In theory, Rent and profit are deductions suffered by wages. In actual fact, however, wages are a deduction which land and capital allow to go to the worker, a concession from the product of labor to the workers to labor. Basically, kind of like how, if you really stop to think about it, you only have bills because you have a job, and you only have a job because you have to pay bills. Marx states again that the level of severity to which the worker suffers is based on the position of society. And once again, he states, in a society in decline, he suffers the most. When society is in a state of progress, his ruin and impoverishment is the product of their own labor and the wealth that they produced. It's a result of the everyday labor itself. And in a society of maximum wealth, they experience static misery as the working class. Now he goes on to introduce this word, the proletariat, the person who without wealth, lives purely by labor, basically the working class. The proletariat in a capitalist society is only considered as a worker. Therefore, 
Under capitalism, one can argue that like a horse, a worker must only get as much as it will enable him to work. It does not consider him when he's not working as a human being, but leaves that consideration to law, doctors, religion, statistics, and politics. Marx wants us to consider two questions, and these are direct quotes. What in the evolution of mankind is the meaning of this reduction of the greater part of mankind to abstract labor? Number two, what are the mistakes committed by the piecemeal reformers who either want to raise wages and in this way to improve the situation for the working class, or regard equality of wages as prad hound, I have no idea how to say, thus, as the goal of social revolution? The way that he's already phrasing this question is, he doesn't consider either of these to be real solutions to the problem of the working class. Neither wage increase or an equality of wages are a solution to him. Now for the next part, I am going to read little bits and pieces of this quotation that he uses by Willem Schultz from his writing Movement of Production. We'll just talk about it as we go. In capitalism, labor only happens as a source of livelihood. The occupations which are based on specific talents or training have become a lot more lucrative. While the reward for more mechanical, monotonous activity, meaning more menial work in which any person can be trained, the reward for that has fallen with growing competition. And this type of work, the more menial work, is what's become the most common way of working in a capitalist state. Now, if a worker in the first category, somebody that's using their talent or their training, this person now earns, well, at the time of this writing, 1844, this person earns seven more times than they did 50 years before. While the person earning in the second category, the more menial jobs, their reward, their wages have remained largely unchanged, even though both of them are on average earning four times more than they did 50 years ago. But at the same time, the people doing the menial job are still doing worse than the person in the first category because the prices for necessities of life have risen. And the size of the wage is not the only factor in estimating the worker's income because you also have to consider the duration or how much people are working. And in a society that does not guarantee work, you can't really expect every worker to have a stable source of income. So he's suffering even then, as he changes from one job to another, or he looks for jobs, or his jobs disappear. In this so-called free competition environment, there are recurring fluctuations and periods of stagnation for the worker. Now he begins to talk about also cotton workers, and even though the machines that they used saved them so much time, that now one person could perform the job that 200 some other people could perform, the capitalist has still figured out a way in which they can exploit the workers. Their hours of work have increased despite the fact that machines made their work a lot easier. But now even in a scenario where all the classes in that society are have more wealth and they're prospering, the differences between the classes will contrast their wealth and poverty even more sharply. And for just because total production rises, and in the same measure as it rises, needs, desires, and claims also multiply, and thus relative poverty can increase while absolute poverty diminishes. Um, which really made me think about the US. Sometimes I wonder, like, poverty is masked because we're not in absolute poverty, as he says. There are people that 40% of people live below the poverty line, yet many of those people will have an iPhone. And it's not a matter of, well, they're just not utilizing their money correctly. We're not dependent on technology, so that person is actually making a logical decision in buying a phone that is a smartphone. But in a state that is forging ahead, which in the course of a decade, say, increased by a third of its total production in proportion to the population, the worker who's getting as much at the end of 10 years as the beginning has not remained well off, but has become poorer by a third. Capitalism knows the worker only as a working animal, a beast reduced to the strictest bodily needs. And now Marx moves on to quoting Schultz. To develop in greater spiritual freedom, a people must break their bondage to their bodily needs. They must cease to be the slaves of the body. They must, above all, 
have time at their disposal for creative spiritual activity and spiritual enjoyment. And he also quotes this other person, I bid, basically the conditions of capitalism are so dire that Capitalists begin to employ women and children because they will pay them less and they can get away with it. Now, the capitalist is always free to employ labor and the worker is always forced to sell it. The value of labor is completely destroyed if it's not sold every instance. Labor can neither be accumulated nor can be saved unlike true commodities. To claim that human life is a commodity, one must therefore admit slavery. The present economic regime simultaneously lowers the price and the remuneration of labor. It perfects the worker and it degrades the man. And then he moves on to quote Buret. I'm so sorry for butchering so many of these things. Up to the present, industry has been in a state of war, a war of conquest. It has squandered the lives of the men who made up its army with the same indifference as the great conquerors. Its aim was the possession of wealth, not the happiness of men. The industrial war to be conducted with success demands large armies which it can amass on one spot and profusely decimate, and it is neither from devotion nor duty that the soldiers of this army bear the exertions imposed on them, but only to escape the hard necessity of hunger. These populations of workers, even more crowded together, have not even the assurance of always being employed. Industry, which has called them together, only lets them live while it needs them. And as soon as it can get rid of them, it abandons them without the slightest scruple. And the workers are compelled to offer their persons and their powers for whatever price they can get. The longer, the more painful and disgusting the work they are given, the less they are paid. So basically, I spoke for so long that my camera is full with footage and it takes forever to change it. So I'm just going to shoot this on my computer. Let me know in the comments of this video what you liked or surprised you most about this first reading. What I was surprised about most is really just how detailed all the disadvantages that exist for workers in a capitalist society have already been detailed in like what more than like 200 years ago. And we just basically as a humanity decided not to do anything about it. <laughs> So far, I really loved how blunt Marx is in his writing. And this is just the first part of one manuscript, okay? So we'll just see how this goes. Thank you so much for watching, if you still are. Subscribe if you like to continue talking about world domination. And I will see you in the next one.